Jordan, one of the things that we've been talking about, obviously, is the big gap that I think we certainly agree on between the, the collectivist identity politics and, and the sublimation of science in favor of subjective politics that favors a power group. Uh, but I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a division that is, is also now breaking out among those of us who I think would consider ourselves friends of the Enlightenment. So uh, you consider yourself a friend of the of Enlightenment style thinking, at least in the essence that individuality matters and that the individual mm -hmm. is sovereign. And uh, that the scientific and, method is And the scientific useful method, and, yeah, that it matters, and, and right, the data matters. And facts are useful and, a exactly. and real. And, and in this group, you know, I consider myself as part of this group. People have started to call it the intellectual dark web. Sam Harris is part of this group. Uh, there, there are a wide variety of folks with a lot of broad political differences that are part of this group. But there are some real differences that are broken out even among people who consider themselves part of this group, right? Mm -hmm. Steven Pinker uh, it has a different perspective on the world than, than you do. Uh, I have a different perspective than Sam Harris does. You and I have our differences probably uh, on some matters of, of philosophy. So where do you think the vulnerability lies in the, in the possibility of revivifying an enlightenment mentality? Because it seems mm -hmm. to me that one of the big problems that's, that's popping its head up above the water now is the rejection of the Enlightenment in favor of this old style tribalism that you've been talking mm -hmm. about. That we're now going to repeat history because we've benefited so much from the Enlightenment that we forget that things don't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. right? We've got so much nice stuff, we live in so much freedom, that we forget that if we just toss those Enlightenment ideals out the window, things get really ugly again. I think that's what mm -hmm. unites. Well, that, that's the question, is that what, what, what do you toss out the window before things get ugly? Right. And the Enlightenment proponents, you could say Harris, you could say Pinker, um, Charles Taylor in Canada, um, they trace back the development of the modern self, let's say. Um, Taylor wrote a book called Sources of the Modern Self to the Enlightenment. And it's quite interesting because like, if you look at the typical academic psychologists say, their historical knowledge generally runs back about 15 years. And so because they're all concerned with the, with the modern literature, and there's some mm -hmm. utility mm -hmm. in that. But that the downside is they don't have any historical context. So you read someone like Taylor and you think, wow, he's stretching it back 500 years, you know. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's reading that goes way beyond that to look at the sources of the self and the source of the modern ethos. And this is a huge bone of contention between people like me, say, and people like Harris. And I think be between people like you and people like Harris is that my sense is that the Enlightenment values themselves are grounded in an ethos that's much deeper and much less articulated. And that would be an ethos of metaphor, image, drama, ritual, religion, art, music, all of that, dance even for that matter. Mm -hmm. The nonverbal, the, the, the pattern recognition. Ian McGilchrist has written a book called The Master and His Emissary, which lays that out quite ni nicely with regards to hemispheric specialization. It's kind of predicated on Alcone and Goldberg's observation that the left hemisphere is specialized for what we know, and the right hemisphere is specialized for what we don't know. Mm -hmm. So that's an order chaos dynamic. And the rough idea would be that the left hemisphere generates paradigmatic systems. So that would be like the Enlightenment system, mm -hmm. axiom predicated. Right, even statable axiom predicated. But that, that entire axiomatic system is based in a nonverbal, in the nonverbal domain mm -hmm. that's associated with, well, it would be associated with the right hemisphere, but it would also be associated with deep motivations, biological motivations, and emotions. And so, because here, here's one way of looking at it. You think, well, how do you validate an axiomatic system of ethics? And the answer is quite straightforward. Jean Piaget figured this out, is you play it out in the world, literally, you act it out in the world, and then you watch each other's emotional responses. And if the thing that you're playing out, if the axiomatic system that you're playing out satisfies the motivations and the emotions of the people who are engaged in that system, then the system is justified. Mm. And then you say, well, it's not just that their motivations and emotions are satisfied, it's more complex, it's that the motivations and emotions of each individual are satisfied, but not only now, but now, next week, next month, and next year, mm -hmm. so you have to extend it across time, and not only my emotions and motivations, but yours as well, now, next week, next month, and across time. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's terribly tight constraints that are placed upon an, ax an axiomatic system's validity. Mm -hmm. Now, the way Jean Piaget thought of that, he said, well, think about it like a child's game. A bunch of kids get together and they decide to play pretend. Okay, and, and pretend is, let's model the world, right? And, and as a place to act, because to pretend you act right. out, right? So the kids get together 
and they assign roles, and they say, well, you're going to be mom, you're going to be dad, you're going to be the dog, and we're going to play house. And then they, they act it out. And what they're doing is seeing if they can regulate the manner in which they're constructing the game so that everyone's emotions and motivations are so well satisfied that they want to continue the game. Okay. And so that's so cool. So what it shows you is that's how an ethical system is is tested and justified. It's Mm -hmm. like you play it out and you see if everyone wants to keep playing. And so that's a whole different methodology than the scientific domain, right? So the axiomatic system isn't, the ethical axiomatic system isn't justified by reference to the scientific method. It's justified by reference to the emotional and motivational well-being of all the players of the game. Mm -hmm. Now that game emerges, this is the second part of this, and this is so cool. Then the question is, well, how does that game emerge? And the answer is the same way that children's games emerges. So what Piaget noted is that kids would get together and they'd play marbles. And if they were young kids, they could all play marbles, say six six years old, they could all play marbles. And, and if they were in a group, they were playing marbles and it all worked out fine. Squabbles and all that, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. you know, it, the kids would keep playing, right. validating the game. But if you took the kids out of the game and you said, what are the rules of the game? They would give completely disparate accounts, <laughs> so they knew how to do it. Mm-hmm. It was like the, the wisdom was in the group. Mm-hmm. The wisdom was fragmented enough among the individuals, so if you pulled the individuals out, they'd give disparate accounts. Mm-hmm. But if you put them all together, they could play the game. But then if you waited till they were 11 or 12 and you pulled them out of the game, mm-hmm. then they could tell you the rules. Then at 14 or 15, they, they would be willing to, this is with more sophisticated games, they would be more willing to regard themselves as makers of the rules. Mm. Okay, so here's how it happens in an evolutionary sense. People, going all the way back to our primate forebears, organize themselves into functional hierarchies. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the the hierarchies are complex, and they're not just based on power, despite what the idiot Marxists say. Even DeWall has noted that chimpanzee hierarchies are unstable if they're only based on power. Mm -hmm. They don't Mm -hmm. last. They they degenerate into violence. So you have a hierarchy that works, but it's acted out. No one knows why it works. Mm -hmm. It works because everyone seems to be happy with it. Okay, and so those hierarchies get more complex and more sophisticated, and then people start to observe them and talk about them. It's like, oh, well, we've got this hierarchy here. What's it like? And then they spin off dramas about the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Here's a hero who climbed up the hierarchy, and here's what a hero looks like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so then you get the idea of hierarchy, and then you get the idea of the hero as the person who moves up the hierarchy and generates it. Okay, then out of that, you get the extraction of the idea of the hero, Mm -hmm. and then you get development of that idea. And it's out of that that you get the monotheistic religions. And so it's like the procedure and the hierarchy come first. Mm -hmm. No one knows what the rules are. Mm -hmm. It's all played out the same way that wolves play it out in a pack or chimpanzees play it out in a troop. Then we wake up and think, oh, we live in a structure. Mm -hmm. Here's the structure. That would be Osiris in the Egyptian Mm -hmm. mythologies. Here's the structure. Here's how the structure goes wrong. Here's what the structure does. Here's its tyrannical aspect. Here's what you have to do to generate the structure and to thrive in it. Okay, that's even more important. The hierarchy is important enough. Mm -hmm. But what we want to know is how to master the hierarchy. Okay, that's where you get the mythologies of the hero. Okay. And then so then there's generates all sorts of different heroes because there's different ways of Mm -hmm. being successful. Mm -hmm. Then you have a panoply of heroes. Then you think, okay, well, now we've got all those heroes. That's a set. We can pull back and say, okay, something about all these heroes is what makes them heroes. That's when you extract out the the monotheistic savior. Because that's why in Christianity, Christ is the king of kings. Mm -hmm. It's actually, you can think about it as a literal statement. Forget about the religious Mm -hmm. overlay. It's Mm -hmm. like, okay, you got a bunch of people. Some of them are kind of king-like. Okay, so you admire them. It's like, for whatever reason that is. It's not easy to figure out why you admire someone, Mm -hmm. right? That's complicated. But let's say you've got admirable, admirable people. You start telling stories about them. Mm-hmm. That's why you go to a movie. Right. You want to go watch someone you don't care about, you're bored by? No, you want to go watch someone admirable and interesting, or maybe the opposite of that, but it doesn't right. matter. It's the same mm-hmm. thing. And then you think, okay, well, we've got all these admirable people. They're generating the world properly. That's what mm-hmm. makes them mm-hmm. admirable. There's a principle they embody, and that principle is the process by which the admirable world is generated. Mm-hmm. That's the logos. Okay. That's the thing mm-hmm. that's operative at the beginning of so, time. So here's my so here's my question about about all of this because now we, we're really not 
talking about 12 Rules for Life as much as Maps of Meaning, which is your first book, which you're, you're doing the, the audio yeah, read I'm of it now. The audio. And, yeah, And uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a harder book uh, than 12 Rules for Life and a much more complex book in a lot of ways than, than 12 Rules for Life. So how universal are these systems? Meaning, why is it that the Enlightenment only arrives at one time in human history and hmm. one place in human history as opposed to if human biology is essentially consistent across, you know, across humanity, then why is it that, that you know, if at the, at the apex of the levels, you end yeah. up with the Enlightenment idea, which is where yeah. we started this particular question, then why is it that it only arrives in one place at one time as opposed to arriving in a variety of places in a, okay. a variety of different that's times a great in a variety question, of different cultures? Man, that's, okay, the first thing we would say is the process by which this, the hierarchy itself and success within the hierarchy is generated that's to be accounted over millions of years, mm -hmm. at least hundreds of thousands of years. But I would push it back because you can see analogs in the chimps. Mm -hmm. So 20 million years, let's say, that's a long time. On that time scale, the fact that the Enlightenment values arose in Europe 500 years ago before anywhere else, it's like, well, who cares? It's, it's, it's five old men long, right? If you mm -hmm. put five 100 year old right, men right. in line, it's like, it's yesterday. It's this morning. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've evolved these hierarchical structures. That's our culture. We've evolved ways of maneuvering within the hierarchical structures that are successful. And now we've started to evolve ways of mapping our, our adaptation. Not just adapting, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. mapping it. Okay, so how does the mapping occur? First, admiration. Second, imitation of admiration. And that would be drama. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you, you dramatize. Shakespeare extracts out what's admirable and interesting and plays it out. So that's the use of the body as a representational mm -hmm. structure of the body. Mm -hmm. So we act out what's admirable. We think, okay, now we've kind of got the drama down. We're all captured by this drama. It's like, well, then the literary critics come along, the philosophers, and they say, oh, what are the principles by which the admirable people operate? It's like chimps woke up and said, oh, well, some chimps are more successful than others. Mm -hmm. What are the rules of success? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, there were no rules because they weren't running by rules. Right. There aren't rules until you describe the patterns. Then you have mm -hmm. a rule. Okay. That's what happens with Moses, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. Moses has a revelation. Here's the rules. It's right. like, yeah, we've been living out those rules forever. Yeah. But we didn't know what they were mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they weren't rules. They were customs. Right. Okay, so you start by mapping your customs in drama and story. And that way you can represent them and you can transmit them. Then once you have them in your grip, mm -hmm. say, they're represented now, not just acted out. Well, then you can move one step backwards from them, mm -hmm. and you can say, well, what's the commonalities among these? What are the general principles? Mm -hmm. That would be the development of something like the Code of Hammurabi, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. like, well, we've got all these customs. What are they? Right. Revelation. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. here's how you map the customs. Mm -hmm. That's the Decalogue. It's the same mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. So it took human beings a very long time to evolve their hierarchies, to evolve their structures of success, and then to have enough people around with enough spare time mm -hmm. to engage in the cultural process of the artistic cultural process of mapping the adaptive structure. That all emerges in mythology and drama. Then that lays the groundwork for philosophy. Then the philosophers could come in, especially once it's written, like in the mm -hmm. Judeo-Christian pantheon. It's like, oh, now we've got it written down. Oh, well, we don't have to remember it, right. we can read it, and while we're reading, we can think about it. Mm -hmm. And so then out of that starts to come the semantic codes. Well, then you get the enlightenment. It's like, okay. oh, well, here's a bunch of semantic codes. It's like, yeah, yeah, those are great. So this is really interesting because you know, if, you, if you read Pinker or if you read Jonah Goldberg's new book, essentially they attribute the, the enlightenment to, Jonah Goldberg calls it the miracle. It, it's almost as though it accidentally occurred in a certain place in a certain time. Jonah doesn't quite go quite that far, I think, to be fair to him, but uh, I think that that philosophy that this sort of sprang up randomly here uh, is is very much embedded in mm. a lot of Sam Harris's thinking, a lot of Pinker's oh, yeah. thinking, um, and you're taking it further back. But I do wonder if, if this may be an area of actual disagreement between yeah. the two of us, which would be fun. Um, are you attributing the growth of the Judeo-Christian ethic uh, that emerges into the Enlightenment as also accidentally just pushing the timeline further back? No, I don't think it's accidental. Okay. And I'm not making a reductionist argument. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is I'm going to say this is how religion evolved. But I'm not saying I'm not saying that this explanation exhausts the phenomena because okay. it's a very strange phenomena. Mm -hmm. It's very very strange. But but that doesn't mean we can't generate a plausible evolutionary account. Mm -hmm. It's like 
If you have a bunch of motivated, emotional, limited beings occupying the same ter territory and competing and cooperating for the same resources, mm -hmm. including the resource of cooperation, which can generate more resources, mm -hmm. not a zero-sum mm -hmm. game, there are going to be patterns of adaptation that emerge from that that are similar. So here's a way of thinking about it. If you put a bunch of kids together, mm -hmm. they're going to evolve games. Right. Well, which games? Well, a bunch of different games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're all games, mm -hmm. right? So even though, so that's the moral relativist element. A bunch of different games. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the moral absolutist element is, yeah, yeah, but they're all games. Mm -hmm. And the games have to be playable, which means they have to continue right. in, in an iterated way, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a big constraint. People have to want to play them. So not only do they have to be games, not and comprehensible to everybody mm -hmm. and enjoyable, but people, but they have to be self-maintaining and everyone has, has to want to play them. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the uh, answer to the postmodern conundrum. A plethora of potential ethical implications of the world. Mm -hmm. An infinite variety. Yeah, okay, fine. Not an infinite variety of pragmatically applicable interpretations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, instantly mm -hmm. constrain the universe to, well, to, to what? Well, this is why there's commonalities in mythologies. It's like, if you put enough people together in enough different places, the commonality of the groups of people, they're, because of the grounding in common motivation and mm -hmm. emotion and embodiment, mm -hmm. because we're embodied, means that they're going to generate hierarchies that are broadly similar, with strategies of success within those hierarchies that are broadly similar, mm -hmm. with descriptions of the strategies that are broadly similar. And so you could say, in some sense, the ethic that gave rise to the Enlightenment is in place more or less everywhere. Now, it's tricky because not every hierarchical system is as functional as every other hierarchical mm -hmm. system. Some of them can degenerate into tyranny. We're talking about the set of all voluntarily playable games. Right, so, right. Something like that, and that can degenerate. Out of that, you're going to get common hero myths. You have to. And then, and then that lays the groundwork that lays the groundwork for even our ability to communicate. Right, right. So, so, and so, this is the, the Enlightenment guys, they just, they're not getting that.